And please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. I like this passage, and I'm actually going to be expanding on it next week as well. But this week, I'm going to be emphasizing verses 28 to 32. Acts chapter 20. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Notice how she does that just before the sermon. Smart child, right? Yeah. You ever been down to Cape May? That's a long way down. Uh, when I was first here, the Bogarts invited us to visit their parents down in Wildwood Crest, and that took hours to get to, and Cape May was even beyond that. Well, Cape May is famous for being the end of New Jersey. It's also got some beautiful Victorian architecture, but it also has something else. It has Fire Control Tower Number 23, built in 1942. This is a very large cylindrical concrete structure with various uh, observation slits in it and even though it's now a popular tourist attraction during world war ii it had something that was more serious it was directing artillery on german submarines that were harassing our shipping going in and out of the delaware bay well it was kind of a lopsided fight the americans did sink 20 nazi submarines on the east coast but the Germans sank 311 of our cargo ships because our watching was not vigilant enough. It wasn't helped by the fact that all the New Jersey towns and their boardwalks insisted on keeping the lights on for the tourist season. And they weren't going to have any blackout regulations imposed on them. So all these ships going along the coast were highlighted by our bright lights. And the Germans said they were like sitting ducks. Well, we all resist keeping watch. It's not exciting to watch for something that may never happen. We would rather focus on the positive things instead of potentially negative things. And yet, if danger is coming, you need to be prepared. And I believe that danger is coming to Ledgewood Baptist Church. I believe this because the Bible says so. Some of these dangers have been around forever. Some of them or just around the corner perhaps. They've been intensifying in recent years. So we have to watch what we believe, what we're being taught, and what we're being asked to work for. And every one of you needs to be on your guard. Do you think you would recognize a spiritual danger if it arose within our church? Do you think you could possibly be the source of that spiritual danger? I would hope not. But maybe we need to have our eyes a little more open. And Paul says we need our vigilance in several directions. First of all, we need to watch ourselves. And people change continually. And that can be a good thing. Uh, as you become more mature, we hope that we have a broader grasp on reality in the world. And that, you know, we become more well-rounded people. We see that with uh, all the graduations that are going on right now. Uh, lots of changes going on. Megan's getting married in a week and a half. And think about the, all the changes that's going to bring to your life. You know, these are good things that can happen to us. But not every change is good. Back in 2010, sociologist Darren Shirkett said that Americans flip-flop on religion more than any population on this earth. He wrote that more than 40% of Americans changed their religious identification one or more times in their lives. Writing four years later in Christianity Today magazine, Ryan Burge analyzed a study that tracks the ebb and flow of Americans between belief and unbelief and between different religious traditions. He found that 19% 
reported a different religious affiliation in 2014 than they did in 2010. He says that defection rate means that nearly one in five Americans change their faith identity not over a lifetime, but over a four-year period. Now, some of those people maybe were changing in a good direction. Maybe it's an atheist becoming a born-again Christian. You know, that, that's wonderful. But I'll bet you most of the time it goes the other way around. As a matter of fact, they say from those graduating from high school right now, the percentage that would identify as Roman Catholic, which nationally is like 25%, will be matched by those who are identifying as atheist. More and more around our country, there is a trend toward unbelief and secularism. And we see that in our own community. And maybe you see that in your own family. So we have to know what we believe and why we believe it. You need to have an informed faith, not just a knee-jerk faith, like, oh, this is what my grandma always taught me. You have to know why you believe it. Note that in verse 30, Paul says that much of the danger in the church will come from within the church, people that are among us. So you have to not only watch yourself, you've got to watch that person sitting next to you in the pew. What are they believing? How are they growing as a Christian? And so Paul says there, you watch yourself and you have to watch the flock. Now he is speaking to church leaders here. He uses the term overseers, which in later years came to be a bishop. But in the first century, really in the first couple centuries, the church was small enough, they didn't have people in charge of 20 or 30 churches because your area didn't have 20 or 30 churches. This is a term that's used for a pastor. And they're watching out for their own congregation. Now, of course, you have to care about your own spiritual health. But what about someone else's? If someone in this church was struggling with doubt, would you be aware of it? Would you be keyed in enough to them that you could help them and pray for them? Because I can tell you, there are people that struggle all the time. Even though maybe they've, you've always seen them here and you just assume they believe like everyone else, there are people that have serious doubts about God. And they're starting to think maybe the world has a better way of explaining things. They're turning to that. You need to be aware so that you can help them back. Now, these leaders that Paul's talking to, they're to be shepherds and not policemen. It's not like we're supposed to go out there and catch people, but we need to be aware of what's going on so that we can help them because this church was bought with a high price. And Paul says there that God paid for the church with his own blood. Literally, it says, with the blood of his own. And so it probably means, obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ, that as he died on the cross, that blood washes away our sin. Now, it used to be the Baptists loved blood. Not as much anymore. Dr. Russell Moore, who's a big Southern Baptist, he says American Christianity is far less bloody than it used to be. Songs like Power in the Blood, or There is a Fountain Filled with Blood, or Are You Washed in the Blood? You used to hear those all the time in all the churches. Nowadays, it's still sung in some churches, like our own church, but fewer and fewer are following that tradition. As a matter of fact, uh, most of the newer songs don't mention blood hardly at all. They mention the cross, they mention redemption, but they rarely bring up blood. It just sounds a little too graphic but it's meant to be graphic. God had to send his son to die for us. It's not a pretty picture. It's a necessary picture because that's how far we are separated from God. We have alienated ourselves and the only way God can bridge that gap is with a sacrifice. The whole religion of the Bible is founded on that and people say it's gross, but that's the way it has to be. In Hebrews 9:22, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So the church is important. The church is bought at a price, but the church has great danger facing it. Savage wolves, Paul says, are lurking outside and they want to come in. Now, wolves are very cunning animals, They're very effective as predators. We tend to think of them as cuddly pets. Just last night, I saw someone in a t-shirt and it shows this wolf on a t-shirt, but it's like snow in the background. It has kind of a dreamy picture about it. Well, you know, if you love wolves, we have a wolf refuge in Columbia, New Jersey. 
Of all the places that should be protecting wolves, they've got one in New Jersey. For $15, you can take a tour and shoot photos of them. I don't think they let you pet them, but you can go out there, you can sponsor them. At my Sunday school class, someone at the early service said, yeah, I've been there, I've sponsored a wolf. You know, they just kind of make your heart go pitter-pat. Now, the Holwicks have different attitudes about wolves. Because when my ancestor built his log cabin near Allentown in 1742, wolves were all over those woods. And there's a family tradition that's been passed down for generations that one day those wolves broke into the cabin and the family had to go up into the loft for protection and to keep the wolves from coming up the ladder. Now, my dad had some doubts about that. He thought it sounded a little too dramatic. But there's no doubt about it. Wolves are very dangerous creatures because they're not only smart, but they work in unison to pull down a much larger animal. And Paul believes that that flock is the church. And it's true in Paul's day. I think it's even true today. Instead of accepting the truth in God's word, many leaders want to dilute it into something that is easier to take. So they only stress the positive. You know, they ignore more the negative things, the things that our society is kind of, you know, drifting away from. They say, well, let's kind of go with society and let's be popular. But I don't think that's the way the church should go. And I think our pulpit committee, they say they've already come across some candidates that raise lots of questions with them. It's like, you know, who is out there? Who are we going to get? Well, you need to be vigilant because not everyone that looks, you know, nice and fine is really that way inside. You have to look at what they believe. Now, what is our church's foundation? I would like to think that over all the years we've been here, that Jesus Christ is at the center. That he's not just a figure that, you know, some churches put them on a cross. We believe he's got to be in your heart. You have to believe in him as your Lord and Savior. Have a personal relationship with him. And we should not water down his teachings. And Jesus says some stuff that's pretty radical. And Americans especially like to say, oh, with Jesus, you know, he would be just like us. No, he's a lot different than us. And we have to always be challenging ourselves about that. Read what he says. Struggle with it. Because that's the way we're supposed to be living, even when it's hard. Our church has always believed that the Bible is the center of what we teach. It's the word of God. We want to believe in it the same way Jesus did. He regularly read it. He memorized it. And he applied it to situations he ran into. Just in my Bible class this morning, uh, we talked about how the disciples were going through the fields and kind of rubbing off some of the grain for a snack and how other people in the town, they said, hey, that's wrong. You're breaking the Sabbath laws. And what does Jesus do? He quotes scripture. He says, well, what about David in the Old Testament? You know, he was able to do that. So if David can do it, we can do it. He knew the scripture. When he was criticized, he always went back and said, whatever your human tradition is, I don't care. What does the word of God say? And that's got to be the center of what this church believes as well. And remember, it's not just, hey, what's the Bible say about, you know, um, you know, criticizing people or gossiping or anything. You have to think about the real core of it, Jesus says in John 5, 39. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Well, something else that we have to be strong on is what church should be all about. Our church has a reputation for being pretty warm and friendly. And we like to talk, you know, we like to kibitz with each other, and that's a great thing. I think we should do even more of it. And we should also reach out and try to get more people in here that we can be friendly to. And it's important to have that great fellowship but we're gathered for a reason. It's not just to have fun with one another and to make friends. We're here to honor God. And I think it's important for us to be Christian. It's more important to be Christian than Baptist. I'm proud to be a Baptist. I'm proud to be an American Baptist, which is kind of the northern flavor of Baptist. But my denomination is not going to get me into heaven. It won't get any of us into heaven. And denominations change over time, and I see a lot of negative things happening among us. Uh, in important doctrines, uh, there has been a lot of wavering. And I've noticed even when I get into a gathering of you know, other Baptists in this state, uh, I'm sometimes kind of shocked at how few believe in the traditional understanding of the Bible. You know, there's actually pastors out there who don't believe in the resurrection as a literal thing. They think it's a nice... Uh, kind of a story, you know, a theme, 
but it's not real. To me, if that's not real, Christianity is false, and you're wasting your time. So make sure you have someone who believes that Jesus really existed, he really died, he really rose again, and that this Bible is the word of God. Not everyone believes that. As a matter of fact, I think there's much more liberalism out there than there is conservatism. And it's not like we have to go after the label. I don't care if someone's conservative. They have to be founded on Jesus and take him at face value. Sometimes, you know, many churches and denominations even, the important thing is keeping that organization humming. Keep it alive. And I say no. The important thing is to stay true to God. And if this church doesn't stay true to God, it shouldn't stay open. It should be turned into something else because the gospel should be at the core. So you need to be on your guard. Paul says it's, it's at the center of his heart. He says, for three years, I pounded it into you. I wept over you. Now, I have tried to watch over you guys and warn you guys for 29 years, probably with a lot less emotion. I'm not that emotional a guy. I don't cry much. But it's important stuff. What do we believe? Where are we headed? And Paul says in the end, the only thing that's going to save you is God's grace. That's the only thing I can give to you. And that's the only thing I can give to you as well. There's big choices that this church is going to be making. Big changes are going to come. I have left one church before. That was in Ohio. And that church still exists, but it's been up and down. It got really big, then it crashed right down. This church has a reputation for stability. We've had very long pastorates, and I hope this next person that comes can stay for decades with you. That would be wonderful. But whether it's short or whether it's long, I want it to be someone who cares about Christ, who cares about your souls, and wants this church to go forward toward serving the Lord. That's what all of us ought to want. So keep your eyes open. Be aware of what's going on out in the world and in your pews. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, I pray for our pulpit committee right now. They have a big task ahead of them. They have to be able to discern things that people often don't want to put in words on a resume, but they have to look between those lines to see what a person is really about. And I pray, Lord, that there would be openness and honesty, that they would truly be able to get to the heart of the matter. Lord, this church is a wonderful church, but it's also a church that's in the crosshairs. There's a lot of people that would like things to be different and perhaps not in a good way. So you have to give us all that united spirit of what we ought to be, what we should believe, and who we should serve. And I believe, Lord, there's only one choice, and that's to serve you. So give us wisdom on how to do that right in a way that truly honors you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, just as we have to keep our eyes open and keep watching, our best comfort should come from knowing that you're actually watching out for us and you do a much better job than we ever could. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you will guide this church, you will guide the pulpit committee and every member, that we will operate in such a way that we will continue to know you and serve you. We pray this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.